All right, so in this tutorial, uh, I'm going to teach you how to do a flag simulation inside of Houdini. And on top of that, I'd like to teach you how to make it loop so that we can get just five seconds and uh, the advantages that come with looping of flag animations that you can cache 120 frames. It'll have a certain uh, file size, but then you could use it, for example, for an animation that's a thousand frames. And this just saves storage, it saves cache time, uh, and it's just more optimized for your scenes. So this is a beginner-friendly tutorial. This should be completely fine for someone who's fairly new. Hopefully you know some fundamentals on Houdini, um, but this isn't too complicated of a tutorial. So uh, the first thing is we use a test geometry called Tommy. Uh, we just use them for scaling reference. Um, this just helps make sure that your simulation gets the right kind of displacement and that the, the wind is accurate and all sorts of stuff, right? So we can just disable him for now. I have uh, this model that I created because it just looks nicer than the models you would just typically create in Houdini. I'm going to provide this in the uh, links below. I'll have a, a link just down in the description where you can download this model and test this out for yourself. Uh, so I just added already a transform node. This just changes the scale so that we have everything looking fine with our Tommy. So where do we go from here? Uh, if you add in a blast node now, now if you don't know what the blast node does, essentially this is, um, if you just click on this button here, you can double click and you can just press enter and then you basically delete parts of the mesh. Now, if you just duplicate this onto the side, you can click on delete non-selected and this kind of gives you two different versions, one that's the pole and one that's the flag. So let's just name this flag here and then let's name this pole just so we have it nicely separated. I'll put my flag here into the left and the pole, we can kind of forget about it. If you want, you can press this little uh, button here, which will make it visible, but this is only on wireframe. Uh, a better way to do this is if you select it and you just press W on your keyboard, then you're basically just making it visible, but with, uh, with actual geometry. And I noticed I actually messed up my UVs here because I don't really need UVs. Um, so what you can just do here is just add in an attribute uh, delete, and we just select delete non selected, and then that way it just doesn't look weird. So, what do we do here from the flag? Now, we can add in a vellum cloth, uh, configure cloth, right? Now, I'm actually going to make this, I'm going to disable this just so we can work and focus on the cloth for now. Inside uh, or after the vellum cloth, we can add in a vellum solver. Now, these are the two most basic nodes that you need in order to make a vellum simulation work. Vellum is just anything that's basically involving cloth or some sort of soft material um, like this. You can also use it for balloons and all sorts of other stuff, but that's for other videos. Um, so the point here is that if we just press play, you'll see this just falls, right? And uh, this already works here. If, by the way, if this is not real time for you, just make sure to click this button here. This will turn it real time. Now, here, you've basically just got gravity, but this is not kind of what we want. What we want is for it to stick to our pole over here. So we need to find the easiest possible way to do this and the most non-destructive way, because there is a, a method here inside the vellum cloth where you can basically just pin some points. So if you just select this here, you can then, for example, just select these and then, you know, sure, when this happens here, this and, you know, this whole this whole thing breaks, which is normal. but. Uh, this here is just, it's its not a very optimized way to do it because then you're essentially stuck to the points. If you're going to change the geometry, um, then these points here will change, which in turn changes these points. Uh, and it just creates a whole mess. And with Houdini, we like to do things procedurally. So let's find uh, an easy way to do this. And the easiest way I think that you can do this, which is just great, is by using groups. So if we create a group here, and then uh, this group, we can, so dollar $OS up here just means that whatever the group name here is used is what's going to be used for the group. So we can call this, um, let's just call this pin group. Now in here, let's just disable the base group and then let's enable keep in bounding regions. And then let's change this from bounding box to bounding object points or vertices. We just need a change here. You can see points or vertices, which means we need to change this as well to points, right? Now you are still getting an error here and you're, you might be confused and as to why, but the reason why is because we need the second input here. Now what we can do is we can take, just take a box, right? And now this happens, but you just see the box here. 
So what can we do with this? Let's just press enter in our keyboards here. Now if you use space one, space two, space three, this just changes the viewport. So I'm just, this is how I'm gonna work, makes it easier. And I'm gonna basically just take this, I'm gonna get in closer and I'm going to select or make the bounding box the size of the area in which I want this to basically uh, hold up. Uh, where is this like this? Okay. All right. So I'm going to just make this smaller. But we have our bounding box here, right? Now, what this does is that if you just press uh, escape, right, you'll notice that it's actually selecting the points within the bounding region. Now, this is useful because you want to have um, you want to have this procedurally done so that when, let's say, for example, we animated the pole, we could have the box be match the animation of the pole and then it'll automatically select these points and whatever the points are in here. So for example, if we were to take the subdivision and then we increase, you see here, the points, it'll still select the points in this area, which is very useful. Now, we do need to also do it for the top version. So there's a very easy way to do this. You simply just add in a copy and transform node, add it afterwards. And then here under the Y translate, you can simply add, you know, or move this upwards like this. Now, if you don't know how to do what I'm doing here, uh, you just press middle mouse and then you can either go down in increments. So you have smaller ones, larger ones, uh, and you can just kind of change the transform like this. So now we've got a pretty good selection here and what we need. So how can we actually pin this? Well, there's a fantastic node in Houdini called the vellum attached to geometry. We can plug this in into the middle here. Now what this node does, is it basically, uh, it selects parts of the flag and it'll try and connect it to the actual model. So here you'll see as well, you have a geometry uh, collision. And what we want to do is we want to take our pole because the pole is something that's supposed to collide. So I'm going to plug this in here into the collision geometry. Sorry if I'm going a little bit fast, but in order to keep this a short tutorial, I'm going to try my best to get this done quickly. Here in the middle, uh, now you can see if we if we preview this uh, vellum attach, right? You'll see that it's trying to basically connect every single point to the actual pole. And what'll happen is if if we simulate this now, you'll notice this kind of just stays in place, and it looks like a thin sheet of metal, right? And the best thing to do to to fix this is to use our group. So if we go into the vellum attach and we scroll all the way up, just like this, you can use a group, right? And we can just select here, and if you don't see the actual group, just change it from primitives to points, and you'll notice pin group. Now, here, if we select this, you'll see that the only things that are being pinned are these here. Furthermore, if you want to have even more control on this, you can actually use a max distance here. And then this max distance, as you bring up the slider, obviously I need to make this in small numbers, right? It'll basically use whichever points are closest or furthest, you know, basically there's like a threshold. Uh, but I'll just keep it so that like all of these here basically get selected and they get uh, pinned. Now, with having um, the, uh, what's it called, the, um, the pole connected into the uh, constraints, you can just take this, and when you preview this now, you'll notice, so yes, this is pinned correctly, and it reacts to the pole. Now, you notice this is extremely bendy and stretchy, and this is not exactly how a flag reacts. Right, so what's the solution to this? The solution is substeps. Now, what are substeps? Essentially, I open up a Microsoft Paint quickly. Essentially, you have uh, you have frames. So let's just take these and consider them frame one, frame two, frame three, frame four. And essentially, the way Houdini works is that it calculates on a frame basis, right? And sometimes this does not provide the best results. So what it need, what you need to actually happen is you need to add some substeps, which essentially means that it calculates in between frames. So if you add, for example, four substeps, it calculates four times in between uh, two frames. Now, this enhances the quality by a lot, but at the same time, it does also 4x your simulation time. Uh, but this is necessary, especially for Vellum, it's always very necessary to have higher substeps. And most of the time we work with 20 or 10 substeps when we're working with this kind of stuff. So we can just move it up to four, see if this already helps. You can see this is a lot slower, but you have no more issues here, right? So in terms of the collision, you can instantly see it fixes the issue. 
Now we can try two, just so we can see if we can make this fast. And even two fixes the issue, which is great. So you want to keep this like relatively low still whilst you're working with it. Um, but you do want to make sure that you have it at a high enough rate so that you can um, work with it without it bugging because you it's, it's very, very important. So how do we add wind to this now? Because this is all cool, but you know, we want a little bit of wind to make it cool. Um, so inside the Vellum Solver, uh, let's go in here. So if you double click, you just, you basically get inside the Vellum Solver and here you've got something called forces, right? Now with the force, you can literally just add a pop wind. This is the only node you're going to have to memorize for the wind. Uh, you just plug it in and then you have all your wind settings here. Now there is, if you go higher up again in the Vellum Solver, there is a force built in wind. Now, I don't like to use the built-in wind because you only have a vector, which is basically just the X, Y, and Z. You only have three options, which is the direction. And here you have amplitude, swirl size. You have so many more settings that can help uh, make this look a lot nicer. So if we go back out here and we just pin this view here, right? That means that when we go inside, we stay in this view. And you can just turn on your guides. Now here it's not going to do anything yet because we need to play the simulation. But essentially with the guides, it'll show you what's happening with the wind. So let's on the X axis add maybe 1.5 uh, wind velocity. And now you can already see uh, this here has shown us the direction of the wind. We can increase the amplitude, say, for example, 0.4. Now you can see that the, uh, the noise is getting a little bit higher. We can maybe increase the air resistance to three. Now the air resistance essentially is how fast does... Uh, does the wind reach this value here, the value of 1.5? And we want it to reach like fairly fast, but we don't want to bump this up too much. So now if we were to play this, right, you can see there's already some wind going on, which is great. Now you can still see some of the stretching here uh, that's happening because we have a lack of substeps, but that's fine. We can fix this afterwards. You can see this is quite like stiff still, you know, this does still look, you know, it's not like there's many wrinkles happening now, obviously, yes subdivisions, you do need to add some in order to have it, but there is an easier way. In the cloth settings here, right, you have two settings down here. You have the stretch and the bend. Now, the stretch, we can just move this up to 10. Essentially, the stretch, this is the stiffness. It'll help with the stretching from over here as well. Uh, but then you also have the bend, and the lower the bend number, essentially, the more wrinkles you'll have. Now, usually, we don't use the stiffness here there's a setting on the side that has this uh, one E plus 10, which is essentially 10 zeros. Uh, and then you have here as well, you have a million, 100,000, et cetera. And you have the same thing here. I'm only putting it to 10 here because one E plus 10 is the maximum. But then for stiffness, usually a good number is uh, this one right here with five zeros in the decimal. And when you do this, you'll then, and I'm just going to go into here so I can turn off the guides. When you do this, you should notice now that there are more wrinkles happening with your uh, with your mesh. Now this is looking fairly decent. Um, we can up the sub steps afterwards as well. Uh, but just for the case uh, right now, I'm going to just keep it like this because that way we have it fast. OK, so how can we actually make this uh, loop? So the idea is very simple. Um, we're going to have a certain amount of frames that we're going to cache. So let's say frame 100 to 160, right? Now, in this frame range, we're only actually going to use the ending here, right? So this is going to be like 120 frames, right? Now, this is what we're going to use. And essentially, we're going to uh, retime this so that it goes from frame 0 to 120. But why do we have this 40 frames pre-roll on the side here? Essentially, what we're going to do is we're going to use this pre-roll. I'm going to put this in red, actually, so we can just see it's like this. We're going to use this pre-roll, and we're actually going to blend it towards the end here so that essentially it'll fade into the first frame here again, right? And the first frame of this is actually the last frame here. So essentially, we're this is maybe a little bit confusing and complicated on paint, especially because I, I'm using a mouse to draw here, and it's a bit complicated. But uh, the concept's very simple, and we're going to do this now. So what you can do is you can drop in a file cache node, right? And inside this file cache, you can set this to an extra. And uh, if you don't know how to remove the green, just control shift click. And now you can set this to 160 frames. So even though everything here is 120, 
we're setting this to 150 now. In production, usually you start from a frame at 1001, so you would use less than 1000 frames, but for beginner's sakes, we'll just do this here like this. Okay, so now that this is done caching, uh, and if you have an issue like this here, um, you do need to reset your viewport. I know this is annoying. Uh, you need to install the labs library and then you can just click on reset viewport. Otherwise, I've noticed that you, I think you just remove the scene view and then you just uh, re-add the scene view here. Um, but here now, so we have this and obviously again, there's still some stretching, but that's because I'm making this faster with two sub steps. At the end, I'll show you how many sub steps I had for the other animation. So here again, um, I have 160 frames cached. Now, I, this ends at 120, but if I were to push this up to 160, you can see the extra 40 frames here. So what we're going to do is we're going to take in a time warp. Now, essentially what this does is that it remaps certain uh, inputs and outputs for frame range. So we'll say our input frame range starts at frame 40 and it finishes at frame 160. So we have 120 frames here. And then our output is be from 1 to 120. Now, what this does is that here for our file cache, you can see that it starts in its idle pose like this, and then it drops. And here for our remap, it goes already in the middle. So this first frame here is equivalent to the 40th frame here. These are the same like this. Now, why is this useful? Uh, well, first of all, uh, it looks very odd if randomly you're, you know, if you're trying to simulate something and then it starts just like this. Uh, but the reason it's useful now as well is because if we add a second one of these, we can take this and we can do the, like actually the opposite. We can go from input frame one, up like the, the input frame one to 40. And then we take the last 40 frames here. So what we're going to do is we're going to take frame 80 to 120. And now what you'll notice is that it's actually still like this all the way up until frame 80. And then it goes down. Now, how can we actually blend these two together? So let's just rename these. So we'll just call this uh, normal, for example, normal speed. And then we'll just call this uh, blend shape, right? Now I gave away the answer a little bit here with the whole uh, blend shape thing. Essentially there's a blend shape node and what blend shapes do is that it takes two objects with the exact same topology. So in this case like this, right? And it basically gives you the option to uh, swap in between them, right? Now, if I connect in from the blend source here, the normal speed, and then I connect the blend shape into the last part, what you'll notice is if I go just to frame 104, for example, in the blend option here, you see I can blend between two shapes. And the idea is that you go from now frame 80 and you blend it all the way up to frame 120. So if we go to frame 80 like this, and then we just press Alt, like hold Alt and then click on this. It makes a little green. And then you go towards the end here. And then you just increase this all the way up to one. Now this should give you a nice transition, which goes back to frame one, which is the same as here, right? And so what this does is that now if we preview this animation, you should notice that this loops, which is fantastic. This is exactly what we needed. Um, so now you just kind of take your, you know, your pole, and then you can basically just merge them together like this. And now you basically got a flag animation that loops. So <clears throat> there's a few extra things you can do to this, like add, you know, a pole animation, etc. If you guys want to have a more in-depth look into how to make this more detailed, uh, let me know. I'll happily uh, make a video for you guys. Um, for the other animation here, the one that was just a little bit higher resolution, I subdivided it one more time. So essentially I just, you know, went from this to this, uh, oh, let me just reset my viewport. So I went from this here to this here in terms of subdivision and I used five sub steps, uh, which is not too much. You could probably use some more, but this, this just happened to work for the actual like scenario here like this. So I hope this get, was like helpful for you guys. Um, let me know if you have any other suggestions for Houdini tutorials. Um, you know, anything just for the basics because I'm not trying to make tutorials way too long. Um, but yeah, if you guys have any questions, let me know in the comments. And thank you very much. Have a nice day, guys. Peace out.